Hello everyone, welcome back to another Ask the Trainer session. My name is Jonas, um, I'm from Maxon, I'm working in the Maxon training team and today I'm here with my friends and colleagues Ellie and Noseman and mm -hmm. we are gonna talk a little bit more about Pyro today because uh, we've seen quite some questions on social media um, but before we get into anything um, you always have to watch the housekeeping section. <laughs> so let me show this. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to remind you that we have the Maxon events page, maxon.net slash events. You can also find that on the Maxon website under news and events. And here all of the webinars that we are doing are listed. Um, we have MoGraph Mondays um, at the moment, um, in November, we have Max on Color next Thursday. We have um, VFX and Chill also next Friday. And then there is another 3D motion show um, coming up. And that's also definitely going to be exciting. All right, whenever you forgot to watch one of our sessions, you can always go to the Max on Training Team website or not the Maxon Training Team website, the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. And here you can find all the recordings of the sessions that we do, plus other stuff. And then, last but not least, I want to share this site with you. And this is the Maxon Ask the Trainer exclusive wear shop, uh, where you can get a t-shirt for free, because we want to thank you for being part of these um, online webinars. And yeah, there is a coupon code that uh, I think Ellie's gonna paste in the chat in a second and also a link to that merch shop. And you go to that merch shop, you um, have to paste the coupon code and go further. And then you pick a t-shirt and check out and then you only have to pay for the shipping and the t-shirt is for free. All right, that's awesome. Now, let me switch to uh, back to the, f uh, the three of us and what do you think what are we gonna show today oh i have no idea whatsoever i'm gonna reply to some questions and all that let's make it a bit more interactive yeah. and uh i appreciate uh some people from the united states um leaving the dinner table to join us oh, that's which great, i yeah. guess it's a good ex it's a good excuse to avoid conversations with family and the odd <laughs> uncle um so you can use it to your advantage if you have any friends that want to avoid the conversations call them up and tell them to uh that they have to watch a very important webinar which is literally fire so uh yeah you can use it to your advantage and uh, invite your relatives to sign up to our youtube channel and get uh, entertained and informed entertained. yes all right entertained well, yeah let me let me share my screen again here so you might notice that this time i'm on a pc um because i've got a better graphics card in there and therefore pyro is running faster so when i um, when I start here, you can see that I already created a little bit of smoke here. The thing that I want to show you, um, because I, I noticed that there was a little bit of confusion about the set and add parameters here, what's the difference and how you can use them, how you can, yeah, what, what's the difference between the two, basically. So what I did so far is I, I had this uh, yeah, default pyro tag, um, emitting some fire and smoke. And to really show you what the difference is between add and set, I want to switch off temperature and yeah, just have a look at these guys here. So we are going to set one of these to just, let's say one density in set and the other one to one density in add mode. And when we do that, you will see that there is quite a difference. So to understand the whole thing, it's best to deactivate a few parameters here. So I'm going to go to the pyro object or bring up the project settings using command D or control D and then go to pyro. And here I'm going to bring down the vorticity and also I'm going to bring down the turbulence. And then let me think, did I forget anything else? Yes, dissipation. 
So the reason why you don't see a difference between these two is dissipation, because there is a huge difference, actually. So let me bring down the dissipation. And now we should actually be pretty good. And let me also deactivate the noise here. So have a look at this. We now have one, this side here, this is the set side, which um, yeah is setting um, 10 density per frame. So the set density or also set um, temperature is always per frame. It's just gonna set this value here in the emission area. Whereas here on the other side, you saw that it's slowly coming in. But if you are at frame 30, and I've got uh, 30 frames per second here in this project, you can see that these two are matching. Um, yeah, these two are matching. So while set is constantly um, having a look at the emission area and sets this value for density, add is just gonna add it per second. That's the main difference here. So what can you do with that? Well, there are a few things that you can do with that. Um, let me just go to the pyro object and let's bring back a few things here. Um, well, maybe let's bring in a little bit of dissipation again, let's say five. And let's also again bring up a little bit of vorticity and also a little bit of turbulence. So now we have this, that's, that's not enough. Let's go with the default values, five each. And maybe let's also add a little bit of, um, of velocity here in the emitters, in both of them. I'm gonna set this to set absolute velocity. And now because um, x, y, z, um, x is set to zero, y is set to one and z is set to zero. This is gonna move the smoke upwards. So here we go. Now it's moving upwards. And now you can see that there is a huge difference because the smoke is leaving its original place where it has been emitted. Um, but here the smoke is just being added per second. And here it is added per frame. But be aware of the fact that this also um, well, that changing the, the frame rate for your project might have um, an influence here or definitely will have an influence. Okay, so what can we do with this? So there are some things with the set that I wanna show. Actually, it's mainly one thing that's really cool. Um, for example, when you now add another object here, like a cube, and let's say we wanna make this another emitter. Uh, let's go to simulation tags and pyro. So this is now a pyro emitter. We are going to disable temperature, disable velocity, disable noise strength. And we are just going to yeah, play with the density here. So basically we can set both of them to zero, but watch what happens when I set the color to some color, like so. Let's set this to green. Let's make the cube, first of all, a little bit bigger here in Z direction, and then let's make it invisible. And now you can see that we have this green line in here because this is setting green color. Why is it just a line? Because in here it's set to surface emitter. If we set this um, to well, off, then it's gonna be a volume emitter, so to speak. And we can now art direct the color of our smoke because we can also move that um, here and there. Um, we can have multiple of these and yeah. So there are some options here. All right, that's one thing that you can do with this. Um, the other thing that I like, um, and that is based on the, um, on the ad, is that you can set add also to negative values. So here you can, for example, type in minus 10, and then this will subtract from 
um, the density here in this case. And now you can see that we created some sort of kill box. We showed that also in a previous Ask the Trainer session, but I just wanted to, to show this for, um, yeah, uh, completion reasons. So yeah, now you know at least two of the things that you can do with these parameters where only one of the parameters set or add is doing something uh, specific. And you now also know the difference between the two that set is setting um, the density or temperature at each frame and add is just adding it uh, per second. So that's the difference here. And with that, um, I don't know if there are any questions about that specifically. Otherwise, I mean, we can directly jump to Noseman. Let me have a look at the questions here. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm put, taking notes. I'm taking notes. You're taking notes. I'm taking notes. I have a few answers for some of our good friends here, including my very, 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 very close buddy, Brandon. And, uh, oh, Brandon is uh, not in the chat. How dare you? So, uh, does the kill box reduce uh, the voxels and so forth? No, uh, it does not. Uh, but <clears throat> it, because the, the volume of the kill box... Uh, you haven't switched the screen to mine, have you? Uh, no, you have to take it now. Oh, I have to do the thing. Yeah, it's, I have to do... it's different today because I'm having two machines here and I can switch between my two yeah. um, <clears throat> computers. So, so you have to actively grab see. the screen. Here we go. We can see your I screen. I have done that. Excellent. So I'm going to go uh, from the end to the... Uh, start from the latest question. So <clears throat> uh, Vitas asks um, about the kill box. Now, because the kill box is uh, part of the simulation, uh, it doesn't kill them, but it stops them from expanding. So the volume of the kill box needs to be calculated. That's why you need to strategically make it as uh, small as possible, just to uh, stop the values from uh, transferring, excuse me. So yeah, uh, it will eventually save you some RAM depending on how your simulation is expanding. The other thing uh, I want to, there are a couple of more things uh, you can do uh, to sort of reduce the amount of RAM. Number one, when you get the message out of memory, it doesn't mean that you have run out of memory. It's a threshold, you're close to 80%. So it will still, after you press OK, it will still keep calculating, but you're getting in that danger zone. So uh, remember that when, when you're doing it, uh, don't, you know, don't panic, just press OK and see how far uh, it goes. Now, the other one is if you go to your settings simulation pyro, uh, over here in the tree settings, I like to close these because they become too intimidating. There's the padding. Uh, the padding dictates um, at which uh, voxel, uh, so let me, let me preface it with, with something that may not be absolutely obvious. Uh, the misconception that when you create a pyro simulation, there's some sort of motion happening, something is moving, is actually totally false. There's not a single moving thing in a simulation, right? It appears that smoke is moving, fire is moving, and all that, when in fact, nothing is moving. This is a, a voxel grid uh, that's very stable in space. It does expand or uh, contract depending on where data exists. The analogy is the following. Um, and I don't have After Effects open, I don't want to open it, uh, but imagine if you're creating a moving circle on your screen, on, on, in After Effects. You make a circle and you animate position from left to right. If you zoom into a pixel level, uh, pixels are not moving, they're just lighting up. Imagine a bus LED screen that the letters are moving by saying next stop. The, the, the LEDs are not moving they're in the same place. It's just that they light up in a certain configuration to portray the illusion of motion. And uh, the simulation does exactly that. It just creates a grid, a three-dimensional grid, uh, a three-dimensional pixel, uh, that the values are transferred from one uh, little box to the other box in a certain way uh, based on the simulation. So that's uh, where I want to begin and uh, talk about the expansion. So uh, 
if you want to see how your simulation is evolving, go to your uh, settings and go to the draw and activate the draw tree structure and just advance a frame. And uh, these are the voxels, including the padding. Because there is some sort of uh, something happening inside these center voxels, what uh, the Pyro system does, it adds another couple of voxels in every direction. So to anticipate any transfer of any of these values. And of course, when we talk about these values, we're talking about these seven grids here. The density, which is a fog volume, the color, which is a vector volume, temperature, fog volume, fuel, fog, velocity, vector volume and pressure divergence. These are all fog volumes, the exact same type of volume you would get if you get a volume builder and set it to fog. The only thing that the pyro simulation does is populate these voxels with particular uh, values that uh, uh, produce the illusion of fire, smoke and all that nice stuff. So as far as the padding is concerned, let's go back. And by the way, my uh, preference is never don't use this pyro. It will confuse you and all that. Forget about this. It's the same parameters. Just press control D. It's in front of you. And uh, you can even um, rip out this manager here and dock it somewhere on another monitor or something or a different window. So you can have the uh, simulation parameters always available uh, to you. And that's what you're going to see me doing. I'm just going to go to the project settings and, and pyro so I can have everything uh, available uh, in my attributes manager. Yeah, that's a really cool so, tip. I'm, I'm also doing that since um, a few weeks now, since I uh, yeah, really as found everyone. out. Wait, wait a minute. I can, I can just pop out those settings here yep. and then you always have the image settings available and next to them, the pyro settings. That's super cool. Exactly. And you can save it with your layout. Uh, not only that, I want to show a few tips that are, so you see this lock here. This lock means that despite what I'm going to say, uh, select here, these attributes are not going to change. And that's great. You can dock it and you can use uh, control and click the hamburger to just fold it down and then just click to open it up. So it's always available to you. Uh, you. You can have anything else selected here, do your little shenanigans and play around with your pyro tag and all that. At the same time, you can just open and close this to get your, your parameters. Now, there's one, you can even save this as a layout. I've created a pyro layout. There's one little issue with this pyro layout that the, it comes in empty. You just unlock and lock and then you continue working. It's just two clicks away when you change uh, your your layouts. All right. You just unlock and lock. Uh, but everything I should continue working until you change your, your layout. Anyway, that's my advice on, on working. Now, let's go back to the padding. Now, um, let's open this. And this padding uh, makes two offsets wherever the data exists, it adds two more to anticipate any potential uh, high speed uh, expansion of any of the data channels, right? And the data grids. And again, data grids referring to these uh, seven grids over here. Uh, so number one way to preserve RAM is to uh, take this down to one. If you set it to zero, you're actually creating a closed um, a boundary. This won't expand, right? It will just, it will be just being in, in a box. So one will create uh, one padding. Now, in terms of the orange ones and purple ones and all that, um, what the, the way the simulation uh, uses it is that anything that's yellow is actually currently active RAM. So this is in a voxel uh, presentation, how much RAM is being used by your uh, GPU. And uh, uh, I mean, I know everyone knows this, but uh, you go to your task manager, go to performance and bring up the the, your your discrete GPU here, and you can see uh, what uh, how much um, headroom you have, and you can do comparisons uh, depending on your settings and all that. So I always use this just to make sure where I am. Um, so uh, padding one, uh, if you're doing very fast moving uh, pyro, you may in need to increase the the padding, and it will cost you more RAM. Uh, but if you're using you know, you know usual stuff like burning houses and hospitals and humans and you know what humans really do uh, burn animals and all that stuff or turkeys for that matter uh, you can use a panning of uh, of one and it will conserve some of the ram of course the other thing is the voxel size um whether we like it or not uh, the higher the resolution uh, we have, the, the more detail we have, uh, the more RAM we are going to consume. So between uh, this particular, uh, let me go to frame five, right? Uh, at frame five, uh, I'm 
consuming this amount of RAM, whatever that is. It, it says some, something around there. Um, but if I set this to one and rewind and go one, two, three, four, five, I can see here, well, slightly more, but not two more. I don't know what's going to happen if this starts expanding. Uh, but what you need to remember is that each square, each cube here, uh, occupies the same amount of RAM in your GPU. So the smaller these are, the more GPU you're occupying. The bigger this is, a big cube occupies exactly the same space in RAM as a small cube, but we have more of the small cubes. That's why we have more accuracy. And one last thing here, the purple ones means that they have emptied. There is no data here. And there's some sort of process which, at the end of the day, we, we shouldn't even have to see these, that they're reserved just in case we're going to need them uh, anytime soon. They were recently emptied, uh, but it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, then they don't really occupy any um, RAM in your in your system. So between balancing your voxel size in your settings, not the voxel size in your object, this is the brush you're, you're painting with, the size of your brush you're painting, uh, because... One thing we need to remember is that the emitter emits, uh, let's say that each um, frame of the simulation is a, a, a brush stroke in Photoshop. And at the next frame, you do another brush stroke in Photoshop. And the next frame, you do another brush stroke. This, the settings we have in the tag applies only to the current frame. Everything else that happens after that current frame is uh, uh, simulated in the GPU and falls under these settings here. And that's why you see that some of the set, most of the settings uh, rely in the simulation itself. After the frame has passed, the emitter has no idea of what happened in the past. It's a very temporal thing and only works with the frame. I'm gonna go into these things in detail uh, in a series of tutorials that are coming out in a few weeks. I'm working on them these days with examples and, and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, this does not change anything in terms of your GPU RAM consumption. Uh, this voxel size is the number one parameter you need to be aware of. If you're trying to make a simulation that is more detailed than the available RAM you have in your GPU, it will fail. Padding, that's one thing you can do. Get the voxel size to another point, and then you go and buy another GPU with um, more RAM. And that is how the system works. As usual, Maxon, Maxon is working behind the, the scenes to make the system faster, more optimized, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, these will always be constraints. Um, we can't overcome you know, physics, well, according to most uh, scientists currently. But anyhow, these are the tips I have. Voxel size balancing, reduce your padding to one if you're uh, burning things um, in a relatively uh, usual rate. And then you go to things that are going to affect how your simulation is going to look. So, for example, if your fire expands uh, constantly, uh, then it occupies more and more RAM in your GPU. Uh, but if you go to your dissipations and you increase the amount uh, where the smoke and the fire dissipates, then it will stop occupying so much, but it will change the look as well. So make sure that you make your fires and smokes look the way you want them to, to look. Look at this. Now it's stabilizing pretty much at this level. RAM is going to increase ever so slightly because it, the the uh, various parameters are dissipating at a higher rate, which means that the, the data is not being transferred continuously. Look at this. 50% dissipation uh, per frame uh, just stabilizes it here and under no circumstances will this occupy more RAM. I know that it's not the ideal solution because if you want to fire, you can't make just a fireball. But uh, tweaking this by small values, uh, if it doesn't change the look of your simulation that much, will eventually allow you to save uh, some of the RAM. So that's yeah. another For those tip. things that you don't need to see in your framing, Oh, in your frame, um, the kill box yep. option is is uh, also there. Um, exactly. And um, it's gonna use the padding, but um, once all the all the pyro has been killed, so to speak, it still has the padding of one or two or or whatever you set up. Exactly. But then it will um, just not use the, the 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 rest that you would usually 
or that it would usually use if you didn't have a kill box. So this so, can uh, help as well. So one more, on a side note, um, if you're working on uh, simulations that are not interacting, so if you have these two spheres burning, it's going to occupy pretty much double the amount of RAM, right? Uh, there, there's no question about that because it's using uh, uh, two times whatever this is going to produce, it's going to produce it here. So in certain cases, uh, breaking down unconnected, so if these are close to each other and you want them to interact in some sort of way, I understand that you can't make two simulations. But if uh, your simulations are not interacting, and I think those squares are a bit uh, too distracting, so let me go and uh, turn them off. So in case in cases like this one here, uh, it's not a bad idea to work on one simulation at a time, dedicate the RAM to a single uh, part of your simulation, cash it out, then uh, start the other one and so forth. So again, that's another um, a tip on how you can save on RAM. It would be nice if we can create a thousand of these and have them simulate at the same time, but uh, that's uh, that wouldn't be reasonable because we do have the hard limits of, of RAM. So let me go to um, another couple of questions that um, I was asked. And um, like the planet exploding, uh, this example. Oh, and see, I do this, and there we go. So this is a very simple setup, and I can set it up from zero, where I'm just having a uh, rigid body dynamic uh, um, setup for um, my Voronoi fracture. And all I'm doing here is adding some uh, uh, temperature, and then I have a fuel cell in the middle that will light up when the whole thing lights up. So uh, <laughs> let's do it. So uh, RBD, the way I'm making it explode, I've removed uh, the gravity from my bullet um, uh, settings, and uh, I've set the collision to have a size increment of five. This is going to cause uh, the bounding boxes of each and every one of these segments to overlap with the other by five centimeters, which means it's going to create an initial avoidance uh, force, and that velocity that's created by that initial avoidance is going to cause an explosion. Excellent. So here's our exploding planet, and uh, you need to right-click and add some pyro, and rewind, press play, and now you have a burning exploding planet, and you can minimize the amount of uh, fire, uh, just to create an initial fire at uh, each frame, something like this, and then all you have to do is go to the center, create another sphere, maybe a bit smaller or something like that, add some fuel to it, because we don't want this, uh, so to speak, to light with fire. We just want it to catch fire when everything else lights up. And you can even set this to be a frame rate, so it will only create fuel from frame two to frame three, and then that fuel is going to burn out. You press play and it's going to go kaboom. There you go. And I can increase it. Let's increase that. Da, da, da. Is this dangerous? If it crashes, you can take the screen. Da, da, da. Definitely. <laughs> oh, it didn't. There you go. So you have a planet exploding. You can change the fragment shapes. You can combine more than one to have microfragments. You can uh, advect particles and all that. Advecting particles, it's funny how uh, people have been asking, how do I advect particles? And Although the documentation uh, is uh, uh, is lacking some of the details, uh, luckily we get to them in, in these uh, live shows, it actually shows an example how to get particles. So it's funny how, um, read the manual, all right? So yeah, uh, so try to read the manual. It's uh, it's good. And uh, Brandon, if you need any other help, just, just call me, right? Let's keep this uh, simple. Now, um, what else do I have here? Um, fuel meshing. Oh, wait, let's go to another question. I memory, the planet explosion. All right. Uh, static frame pyro export. There we go. So uh, I had a question which I replied on Twitter, but I'm going to put it here. People are asking, how do I save uh, a specific frame? Ah, this is perfect. I want this as a VDB, right? What do you do? You just right click and you say current state to object. This is going to create, you can throw away everything else. We don't care about anything else. You have a density grid now and a temperature grid. And if you want to combine these, you press shift C. This exists only in your commander and you use a um, volume set. Uh, the volume set is used to combine independent volumes. You can create them using a volume builder and all that into one 
a multi-grid uh, VDB file which you can save. So you just drag your density here, your temperature here, and you can get rid of this and you can go and save this as anything you want. So now you have a static frame and you can save it on disk. Another way is <laughs> simulate your whole simulation and delete every other VDB frame you don't like, right? That's the uh, simplest. Well, it's, it's interesting. But, um, can you, well, when I tried it, I think I set the, um, the in the pyro object the those volume grids to on and when i did it then i think it created this volume set automatically if i remember correctly oh okay whatever yeah that could be the case i might be wrong here but i think okay. it was it's, that way yeah yeah uh, yeah no problem no problem yes so <laughs> what else do we have now one thing i want to show uh because i think ellie has some interesting things to show so i'm going to show this um, what I like about the pyro system, because I understand people are comparing the pyro system with uh, industry standard, uh, you know, th stuff we see in the movie, which uh, usually what's not told is that in order to get this pyro simulation, the computer was simulating for six days and stuff like that. OK, we don't do that yet, but. And, and I don't think there is current interest in, in the way people want to use this. We want something that's fast, simple, fancy, fun to use, and all that. And within those boundaries, if, if you want to do massive explosions with uh, uh, measurable detail and all that, uh, get the highest uh, RAM uh, available on a GPU, that's number one, uh, or use another dedicated uh, software that does that because this is out of the scope of what we are trying to do with our pyro simulations and it's only going to get better from this point onwards but it's not only about explosions so here's a, a nice little example you you get your sphere and you add your pyro and we know that this generates these grids here now what happens if instead of a pyro I add a fuel. Now what's going to happen, I'm going to advance one frame forward. You can't see really anything here. I'm going to turn the sphere off, but there's a very nice visualization method you can use when you go to your uh, project settings and you go to the draw and down here, um, it tells you which volume do you want to draw? I want to draw the fuel. And this now illustrates in your viewport, the amount of fuel we have here. And this is what you're seeing here is a volume builder in fog mode with a certain amount of values. And the values are just dictated by what this is going to do. So we can take this thing uh, immediately and I can turn off my drawing and I can put it under a measure object. And I can change the mess. Yeah, I need to activate my fuel. There you go. So now I'm meshing that volume. And you, because it's surface, it has a hole in the middle. There you go. Now, the great thing about this is that the fuel, just like every other of the uh, grids generated, can be affected by forces. The, these Imagine the fuel being an actual fuel that's laced on uh, an object, but has the ability to be moved around uh, using uh, forces and all that cool stuff. So first of all, uh, we see this, uh, uh, it stops uh, creating when I'm playing and it starts again when I stop it. This is a very simple thing that has been shown many times. I think Jana showed it as well. Simulation, oh, uh, yeah, and just go to the scene and simulate before generators. Just to, to tell it that first do the simulation, then uh, create the, the meshing. Now we have this, you can see it's doing that run, uh, that, that little noise thing. That noise thing is coming from the noise of the emitter. So I'm going to set this to zero. Then I'm going to go to my scene settings. And in the extra forces, uh, there's some turbulence in here. I don't want any turbulence. Uh, I don't want any gravity. I don't want any of this. Just leave me alone. Sorry. Uh, that was uh, some anger. I've had some issues. So uh, here we have a very stable, um, let's say a very stable fluid that we are meshing. If I use now any of my forces, let's get a turbulence force here and let's just pump it up to 100 and uh, make uh, the frequency scale 100, uh, sorry, the, the scale of the turbulence and do that. Now watch how this starts getting moved around. Now, here's the great thing about this, depending on how uh, you are using your, your forces and all that, you can start creating growing structures 
by lacing them with fuel and uh, even lighting them on fire and using the temperature grid uh, as the source of your meshing and, and stuff like that. So this is fuel, right? Good. Because it's fuel, I can go to this uh, uh, fuel and add, and let me draw this so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's go to the pyro and let's draw it so we can see the shaded view. So this should, uh, oh, it's only fuel, so I don't see it. I'm going to go and add a second little sphere here, make it teeny weeny weeny, weeny small and uh, light this on fire. So right click, simulation tags, simulation tags, pyro. So it's gonna light the other thing on fire. Rewind, press play. So uh, what have I forgotten here? Draw pyro, yeah, see? What? So I've done something here I may have not, oh yeah, I turned off the pyro object which holds the data. There we go. So. Look at that, look at that. It's lighting fire, and because we have a significant amount of fuel, it's starting to burn the fuel. But what's happening is that the actual, uh, let me go here and turn off this and turn on the temperature. So I just want to see uh, the temperature and turn off the pyro. I just want to see the temperature grid, nothing else. Turn this off. What you're seeing here is the growing temperature because the fuel is burning. And I can uh, control how much fuel I have to, to make this uh, you know, far, go faster or slower and all that, but it's still a grid. I can take this temperature now and mesh it, and this is gonna be a growing coconut or something like that. You can make it uh, grow cells, you can make it grow trees, you can make, there are so many permutations um, just by playing around with this. All you need to, to remember is that these are just volume grids. Uh, go to Cineversity, find volume, find the, I, uh, I've uh, tweeted a few days ago, understand how volumes work. And then the pyro system is just a system that allows volume grids to evolve in time and in space uh, to imitate fire. But you can use them for many other things. You can make things look as if they're uh, liquid because I can set my uh, gravity to, uh, let's say, instead of the default, I'm going to um, reverse my gravity or I'm going to set my buoyancy uh, to a negative value, extra forces buoyancy. I'm going to make this 10 and make this uh, minus uh, whatever it is. And now I'm going to press play and this should start flowing downwards as well. The, 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 this is this sort of uh, functionality. That looks it's bloody cool. got five objects. Five objects. I mean, who wants uh, planets exploding when you can just add five objects here and have this thing create an amazing uh, thing? Which let's sculpt it. I'm going to make it look at, as a certain shape here. How am I going to do that? Just grab any random object. Let's uh, get a. Um, let's get a. a pyramid and put it down here. You know why? Because I'm going to add a collider to this. I'm going to make it invisible. And because it's a collider, it's going to allow the fluid to flow around the pyramid and create the shape inside. Like really uh, show me another uh, uh, software that can do these kind of things at this ease of use. Just add it, add a tag, press play, you're done. And, and this is what I think um, currently, because it's a new technology, th this is the, the general knowledge that's uh, missing. And it's not even knowledge. Uh, it's just the inspiration. That's why um, what I would advise is that just on Twitter, wherever you go, talk to other people that are using it, use these small ideas, expand on them, show your work, because by inspiring each, each other on how we can use uh, these things, well, we can, we can make uh, things that were unimaginable until now. You can grow something in the shape of something else by putting a collider around it to make it seem that you're, you're creating an, a human ear, you know, or something like that. You just get a model of a human ear, make it uh, watertight, uh, put some uh, fuel inside it, light it, and it will grow to the shape of an ear, right? Uh, th that's the kind of stuff you, you can do with this system. And this is just, uh, you know, us scratching the the surface uh, of this uh, don't think of it just as fire as smoke and all that think of it as the ability to propagate volume values or any gaseous or fluid uh, moving 
and I say moving in in, in I think quotes. That's what it's, we wanted to talk about next yeah. uh, in the next session a bit more as well about <laughs> like thinking outside the box and um, creating cool stuff with pyro that doesn't look like fire. You're already teasing uh, quite cool stuff. <laughs> I like this. It's, that it's object funny is super was... cool. Save it. Send it I'll... to me. I was doing this. So this is the example I was going to show you, but it's so like uh, flesh tearing off someone's body, right? You can localize this and make it seem, do a sci-fi thing, whatever you want to do. And then while I was recreating it using the same concepts, uh, this is what came out. So what you're seeing here and what you're seeing here is exactly the same uh, technique to produce two extremely uh, different things and that's what I, I i think is the magic about the system yeah you can do fire everyone loves fire you can burn things you can light fire inside text you can light fire outside text you can light um anyway you can just do uh, fires let me bring you some burning text here i'm going to bring this in here click ok for whatever reason and uh, this is something i was working on uh yesterday so fuel coming in uh, and uh, fire. What did I do here? Yeah, this. I think this is a fuel, and the fuel is catching fire, and this is what it looks like, and I put it in um, a redshift. Let me bring the redshift uh, view over here. Boopy doopy doo. Uh, redshift render view. And this is uh, what this looks like. I made the the um, that of glass. I used my shader, so... And it, it, this, this took me uh, maybe 10 minutes, nine and a half to to come up with it because creativity is not my strong point as you can see uh, very clearly uh, but nonetheless uh, yeah it, it's as simple as that and in my view it's um, uh, we're setting a trend of the ease of use uh, of uh, these sort of um, evolving systems and simulations and uh, very soon I think uh, I'm going to start developing some particular... After the first batch of tutorials, I'm going to start working on all the non-standard ways you can use it. And that's why it's going to be in two weeks our, our subject. Because there's more to do outside the box than there is to do inside the box. That That's what, what I believe. Oh, so let's see if there are any questions here. The few working with an animated textures like white dot and animate... Yeah, okay, that's a good... Okay, can, can I go with this quickly? Yes. So the way you transfer textures is uh, via a vertex map. So that's what I did in my first uh, example. I always click the wrong fuel meshing. This is basically what, what I use, but I'm going to set it up. Um, and that's because we can add vertex maps now on uh, primitive objects, just like you can add textures. So you can go here and say other tags, vertex map. And in the vertex map, you can use random fields or even a shader field and the shader field will allow you to bring in even um, any image and put it in here so let's see if we can do this with the, the dots uh, and I think we have the tiles somewhere here it's, there you go you have tiles and you can change the colors to represent their maximum and minimum values so what is that the gray I'm going to make it black so black and white values. And because we can use vertex maps to drive simulation pyro, and we can drive the density, we can drive the temperature, and we can drive the fuel. I'm not going to do any fuel now, but what I'm going to do is just go to uh, temperature and density, drag this thing in here, booby dooby doop, and this should light uh, using the little square. There you go. Does that answer your question? So let's see what else. Uh, multiple GPU support, not uh, at least not yet. There was one question yeah. about the difference between uh, the voxel size and the object voxel size. Um, I can take it if you want me to. One, let me just uh, quickly, uh, James, Willie, how do you go about rendering? It's in the manual. All right, let me show you quickly. So if you want to render in Redshift, as we've shown, you activate the grids, you turn on Redshift, and you create a material. Right, there we go. Power volume, and you drag it on here. And then your question is, yeah, but it doesn't work in bucket render. And that's because the bucket render requires the data to uh, exist beforehand because it does a pre-roll. Uh, so all you have to do is go to the pyro, uh, set these two on or on export, the ones you want, you create a cache, and then you render. Uh, it has to be cached. So that's the, uh, the simple solution. And that's for a very good reason, right? Don't, don't say it's, um, you know, it, uh, I don't like it. 
there's a very good reason for that. The amount of data that's going on around uh, when we are uh, doing pyro uh, is immense. And if you want to render something on the GPU, it actually has to uh, double the amount of RAM it uses uh, because it, it calculates it. It's on the, the the GPU and then it has to download the Cinema 4D and re-upload it for rendering because the the RAM space of the GPU currently is agnostic of the RAM space of the uh, the simulation. So at this point, you just um, export it. And let's not, you know, let's not be uh, totally, um, you know, to complain too much. The the caching takes uh, a very small amount of time to do. I'm just uh, getting a folder here uh, ready. And let me just go into that folder. I'm going to bring it over here just so that you can see I'm not lying. Here's an empty folder. I'm going to press save. And it's going to take two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Amazon, nine. Oh, there you go. Ten seconds to, to uh, cache 90 frames. Yeah, you get up. Get a coffee and it's ready. Now we can render using any means we want. I can uh, go to, I can render this frame here. And there you go. It's going to do the GI and then it's going to render everything else. Rendering. There you go. So that's how you do that. Stop. Yes. And you can even do that in the render view using this uh, little button here. Let's, I want to add a, a dumb light. I always yeah, like to have a dumb light. There was well. one more question yeah. which I find um, very important to, to answer, um, which is about um, yeah struggling with cache sizes. Of course, it's, it's good to cache everything out because then um, you really have that animation or simulation. Um, so you can scrub through it and it doesn't have to have to be calculated. So yeah. w when it comes to VRAM first, um, I think it's, so my workflow usually is that I cache out the pyro part before I switch to Redshift because Redshift will also automatically allocate um, VRAM and those two might fight, uh, fight each other. So um, I first simulate and after that I switch to Redshift. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is, um, definitely have a look at when, when it comes to the cache sizes. I, I created uh, volume caches that were 150 gigabytes. And uh, you can fill up your drive no matter how big it is quite fast. Oh, I filled it up multiple times. Yeah, yeah I filled it up. Uh, let me, let me t say you, uh, tell you something, though, uh, that um, one thing... Uh, do you want to stop it? Of course I want to stop it. So one thing you need to know, when you do a test uh, cache, uh, all you have to do, you don't need to go and, and clean things. You do your test cache, do your test renders, you play around, you just delete cache, and it will delete all the files from the disk. So this is the folder. Just going to put it here. Going to click yes, and it's empty. Okay, so the caching is not a process. Oh, I'm going to cache. I'm going to forget about it. I have to go to my uh, explorer. I have to, no. Do your cache, do your render, delete the cache, do your amends. It's literally five seconds we used to wait 45 minutes to see a little square this big using physical render and now we're caching a whole simulation and we're rendering it using gi at uh, 4k and all that in less than 10 minutes and we're complaining don't do it <laughs> don't I'm, I'm i i'm i'm from the 60s right uh, the, the fastest computer the fastest computer and still looking was, so good look at him was a calculator oh yeah yeah that's that's a different thing that's a, let's not let's not <laughs> uh, digress here with my beauty and uh, very good looks and, and uh, smarts. Uh, Not but, to forget uh, the sexy voice. <laughs> yes. So um, <clears throat> the, the idea is that we need to understand there are certain limitations and certain workflows uh, with the great power comes uh, a bit more fussiness, right? So go here, cache it, do your tests, whatever renders you want, between caching and doing your render, there's a 10-second uh, delay. Do five push-ups. That that's actually going to be uh, uh, good for you, or some, or sit-ups, or something like that. And uh, or read one of my tweets, or watch ten seconds of my tutorials, or you know, yeah, there are so many things you can do in ten seconds. And then do whatever you want to do. Delete the cache and start again. That, so one thing that, that is one thing that is also okay. very important to to know to uh, if you want to reduce file size. If you go to the to the object tab of the pyro object, knows name, um, 
so people can see it. So here we have all of these grids and by default, density, temperature and velocity are um, set to on export. Um, velocity is a grid that you only need for motion blur and sometimes when you want to use it um, to create other forces um, inside uh, of Cinema 4D to advect, um, yeah, particles and uh, yeah, other simulations. However, the velocity grid is a vector grid and it's extremely big because it's caching out um, the whole grid, including all the padding and so on. So if you just set um, velocity to off, if you don't need motion blur, for example, this will already save you a ton of megabytes per frame. Um, and also I would just recommend you to only export what you really need. So if you only need density, only export uh, the density grid. If you need density plus color, do density plus color, but um, leave velocity alone. Velocity is the biggest one of all of them. I'm, I'm showing all the grids. I have a file which is ready, but me doing it, I'm, I'm sure everyone wants to see me doing it as well. So I'm just making copies of the grid, uh, of all the grids. I'm naming them and I'm activating only that grid. This is something I advise you to do to see what's going on. And then I'm going to take all these things and I'm going to say coordinates uh, num uh, times 100. So it's going to put them there aside. And I get to press play and it's going to bring all the grids in. These are the grids. And maybe I need to do uh, num. See, the velocity which is, grid is covering almost yeah, all of the grids. Times uh, 300. There you go. So these are the grids. And you can see that uh, the, the density has, uh, and let's turn off uh, from our uh, settings here, I'm going to turn off the draw pyro so we can only see the pure grids coming in from these. Now, these are just now representing in the form of a volume object, uh, each and every one of the, the grids that are generated. So density is one value per voxel, and it's this little cloudy thing. Color is a large one because it uses a vector per volume, right? It shows it in this form. It doesn't show it as color. But the, the color is one that will take three times as uh, much RAM as this one here. So don't use color unless you are using color. You can always colorize it in the... Uh, if your color is not changing, colorize it in the volume during rendering. When you yeah, want to mix lights. colors between... Yeah. Exactly. If you want to mix colors between smokes and stuff like that, uh, then use the color. Otherwise, uh, don't use it. it. takes up too much RAM. Then we have the temperature grid, which is, again, a, a float value. Now we have the velocity, which is, uh, again, quite big because it has all the velocities, local velocities of what's going on in there. So if, as Jonas said uh, uh, very much correctly, don't use the velocity if you're not going to use it to advect particles or do something with the velocities themselves. Then you have the, the fuel, which is somewhat, what is that? Temp that's temperature, which is here. Then it's uh, fuel, which is empty. So don't do anything with fuel if, unless you have fuel. Then you have the velocities. Then you have the pressures and you have blue in the new visualization of the VDB of the fog volume is negative. So we have negative pressure here. It sucks things up. And uh, here we have positive uh, pressure. And then divergence, which is um, something I'm working on uh, in, in what how we can use it. It's still fun. You can still mesh it. You know, if, if you don't know what something does and your friends are around and they're giving you a hard time, just mesh it. That will impress them. And uh, oh, look at that. That ain't bad. Okay. That's so our this job, is to impress people, people, right? Everyone's job True. is to impress True. people. Uh, yeah, in, inspiration uh, comes from uh, uh, impression first. You know, that's why uh, we can teach kids things, because we can convince them for all the things that are lies, essentially. Anyway, um, and uh, I would suggest as a little experiment, um, go do this. Uh, create any random pyro. Create all the grids. Name them so you get familiar with the names, uh, turn them on and everything else off. And just to let you know what this is doing, this is uploading a single simulation to the GPU based on these settings and this emitter. So the, your GPU RAM will not be larger because we're bringing these in here. But then we're bringing the data inside Cinema 4D as independent grids. That's what we're doing. And what I would 
I suggest you do, again, just to have fun, create volume, uh, redshift volume shaders. Uh, it's funny that I say things and then I go and do them, right? I might as well just do them. Uh, create a redshift um, pyro volume. And uh, you, you need to make sure that you have the correct uh, names here. So uh, if I double click on this and go here, we should... Did I close the hamburger? There you go. Uh, you should be able to find the each one and their grids. So each one of these is an object, and each one of these are the grids. You can start creating um, various volume materials that are populating using uh, each grid and see how it looks like. Uh, that should become part of your, um, I would say, experimental usage of Pyro. For example, the velocity, because it's um, a vector grid, you can actually use it in the color of something. Ah, that's that's going to be fun. So let me, you know something, I'm going to try that. <laughs> Why not? Do I'm going to... I'm going to use the density, and the, I can always go and use that. I'm going to delete everything else, and the pressure and all that. I'm going to use the uh, density in here, and I'm going to use the density and the velocity. And I'm going to go to my material. I'm going to use a density for density, and let me drag this on this. And I'm going to go to the density color and use the velocity. You know why? Because I can. That's the coolest thing. These are superpowers. Yeah, I can do it. I'm going to do it. Let's see what this does and see how my superpowers hold up to uh, potential destruction of the universe. So let me add uh, my dome light. I'm not going to press render before I add my dome light. And now I'm making it slow and painful. Everyone, I know everyone's anticipating. What's this going to do? It's probably going to fail totally. Let's see why this is failing here. It has to do with the magnitude of uh, the the colors. Yep, that is the color channel. We we can't change the color channel. So this is uh, a good reminder uh, for me to to tell you what happens. The velocities are very small values that dictate where everything is uh, going. And it could be that the velocities are in the range of 0, 0 to 0 0.0000001. So essentially everything looks <clears throat> uh, like it's uh, black. So let's see if we can do something about this. I'm, I'm going to try something uh, experimental again. And then if it doesn't work, I'm going to drop it. I'm going to create a separate volume for the By the density. way, on the other hand, they are also unclamped. Yes. So they can go much higher than one. Yes, they can. So I'm going to call this uh, vel, right? I'm going to call this velocity. And I'm going to use uh, my, my settings here just to have the same voxel size is five voxel size. I'm going to create a volume builder in fog mode, set it to five, drag the velocity in here. <sighs> And remap it. I don't know if this is going to work, but it's uh, range map it and say the output max. I'm going to set it to 10,000 times bigger. Now let's see if I can feed the product of this into this. If it fails, um, someone please delete the rest of the video and uh, let me know how that goes. I'm going to go to the volume builder. See if that does anything. Oh. So that's the color channel. I'm not seeing any colors, though. So we have the density, and the, I'm going to call this uh, color from Vel. Just it's make sure. To, I'm gonna... It's set to fog. When it's fog, it cannot do color. Ha <laughs> ha! Vector! Thank you very much. So um, let's go vector scale and scale it by uh, 10,000 time so this uh, should become times 10,000 there's a ratio going on there so 10,000 let's see if this is going to work and if this is not going to work so it's name based so ah come on yeah the, uh, the, the value was clamped so it although you multiplied it 
Uh, it didn't go higher than 100%. Like the scale. Uh, oh. use, use the scale value instead, down. Oh, it doesn't allow you to go, okay. No, it's, it's, it's strength. Use the scale value, maybe. Oh, sorry. I, I thought that said scale. Don't, I, I blame it on my bad uh, sight. Eh, it's not doing anything, and that's quite unfortunate in this particular case. Color from velocity. Let's make sure we rewind this. Ah, that should have worked. I need to look into this because um, it should be fun to experiment. But there you go. You have your homework. Play around with these things. I'm pretty sure I've done something wrong. And that's because, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm combining these two volumes. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing something wrong here in my configuration. But anyway, these are the kind of things you can experiment with and figure out uh, what's, uh, you know, what's going on, uh, potentially, and start experimenting. You can mix and match using uh, various methods, like dragging things and, and doing all that nice stuff. And hopefully you'll have more luck than I did. Anyhow, I think um, I'm going to rest my case now because I'm digging myself deeper and deeper and deeper into this okay. hole I will not recover. So back to you, Jonas. Back to me? Back to me. All right. Uh, let, me, let me quickly grab the screen here. Challenge accepted. Yes. Cinema 4D. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk um, about the difference between voxel size and object voxel size. So here I have an object and the important thing about this object is that it has a like, yeah, diagonal or tilted surface here. So it's not totally matching the, the volume grid, right? And if I press play here, I already deactivated um, um, temperature, you can see at the very first frame that we've got all of these steps here going on, right? And these are coming from, let me do the same thing that Noseman did. I'm gonna just pop this out and drag it on here. Right. Um, and now if I go down with the voxel size, let's use one centimeter voxel size and just go to the next frame. You can see that those steps are still there. And this is because here in the object voxel size, it still says five, right? If I bring that down, you will see that this is much smoother now. Now, why do we need the two? That's basically because the, the voxel size in the pyro settings is like a global thing. It's it's the voxel grid that you cannot um, change in um, its alignment. But this one here is just for the emitter, for the emitting shape, and it's in local space. Now, I don't really know what's a good way of showing that. Maybe if we tilt it, I don't know. However, one is um, object space, the other one is world space, and yeah, that's that's uh, pretty much it. The, um, this one is defining the the resolution of the emitter, more or less, in object space. So one more thing that I want to add to um, the technique of or the workflow of using the attributes manager or the the project settings here instead of just using the pyro objects pyro tab um, is that you here have a few other things that you can use. And the scene scale doesn't do anything to, um, uh, to the pyro um, uh, simulation, um, but the other ones do. So if you reduce gravity, this will have an influence on the buoyancy. There cannot be buoyancy without gravity. So if you set this to zero, let me, let me just bring up uh, temperature again. So now this should emit exactly that's what it's doing it's emitting right but if i set gravity to zero you can see that it's not going up anymore 
it's moving around and so on. That's because of the noise. That's because of um, a little bit of turbulent. No, it's not, not even moving. It's just the noise part of it. All right. And then there is this other thing that I wanted to show. Let me go back to the default here. If you right click these arrows here, you will always go to the default value if you didn't know that. And time scale, if I bring that down to 0 0.01, is the one that you can use to create like slow motion effects. That might be a little bit much. Too much, too much. Here we go. So now you can see that it's slowly going up. And if we reduce it a little bit more, let's say to 0.3, you can see that we still got the buoyancy, but it's a lot smaller, a uh, lot smaller, slower. Yeah. All right. Still, this has an effect or yeah, the, um, dissipation has an effect per time. So you can see that this is also changing the look here. It's not the same look. So you would have to counter this with the dissipation settings to um, get the same look more or less. So we can bring this down and now we should get a look that is closer to what we had before. Yep. All right, that's what I have. So. Um, you teach something about Ellie is going to show something. Do you still want to show something? I mean, you've got 10 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll save it maybe for another day because it's not a it's not a quick process and I don't want to speed through it too much. All right, then we want to see it next time. So yes, let, let's see I'll if make we sure have I other it. questions. Left. I was going to say there were a couple more questions, so I don't want to take up that space as well. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so definitely check out the next sessions because Ellie is going to show something awesome. As He's... Usual, <laughs> as usual, boring. So let's go to the questions. Um, <laughs> uh, spirit of Ancient Werewolf. We need to talk about that, but in another session. So another question about any feature of new Pyro in game dev without ABC format. Let me, something like FBX, any idea about export for game dev? Um, well, I don't know. It's down to the game engine. I did not have no idea if Unreal Engine or uh, Unity or anything like that imports VDB volumes. I would su be surprised if they don't or there's no plugin for that. But I think that game engines are quite good in creating their own stuff now. So I, I would not know. That will be more of a third party explanation. So, uh, how can you set a low voxel size, say one centimeter, without crashing or freezing Cinema 4D? Oh, that's simple. You buy a card with more RAM. Let's go. Um, so there's a question. What else? Uh, I had a scene with cloth and pyro mixed. Can I cache the cloth simulation, but not the pyro simulation and vice versa? In yes. theory. Well, I didn't try that, but I think that should work. Because Oh, yeah, here... yeah because the, the VDB only caches through the pyro object and exactly. it's agnostic. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You can the other cache way them around, separately. if we now add a plane here and add a cloth um, tag, for example. By the way, by the way, VDBs do not store uh, geometry data, data. They only store volumetric data. Yeah. So, yeah, you can export them both. You can cache them both at the same time. One as uh, Alembic or whatever, and the other one as, um, so as, you know, cloth cache and the other one as VDBs without problems. Yeah. Okay. Let me just quickly quickly do that here so let me bring the voxel size down let me also go up with the with the segments here and let's also uh, doo -doo. what else do we have here we go we need to bring up the fluid force factor because otherwise the cloth wouldn't react to the fire and let's see what happens now Oh, it explodes. But you can see that they are interacting with each other. Pretty extreme, but they are doing it. By the way, uh, because Hannah uh, has been complimenting me, I'm going to answer her question about how to uh, recolor fire. So when you're done, I'm going to let me know so I can grab the screen back. All right. Anyone that gives me... 
Anyone that says a compliment about me gets uh, an answer. Extra tutorial. And everyone, yeah, and everyone else unlocked. <laughs> and achievement unlocked. Everyone else gets it as well, but uh, I'm emphasizing on the people that uh, provide me with uh, compliments. It's always good. Oh yeah, so this one is exploding. Um, I would have to to explore that a little bit more. So you you can you can grab it if you want to. I would have to investigate here a little bit. Okay, there we go. Um, it should be visible. I'm looking at the feedback. There you go. So my screen should be visible. Very simple. Just a simple sphere with a pyro tag, uh, with a pyro default. And I'm going to activate. Let's say we're going to render only fire. So we can render fire. Let's render fire and smoke. And we're, I'm going to do it in the uh, picture viewer because I don't want to cache right now. But you can always cache if you wish to do so. So again, and this is for Hannah. Everyone else, close your ears and your eyes. You're not allowed to see this. So redshift materials, pyro for volume. You, Hannah. For you. Just for you. So now we're going to stop the render so we don't overload the uh, GPU RAM and then turn it on. So this is the, the standard situation we have. Uh, the good thing is that if I deactivate uh, one of the, the grids and go and redo this, um, let's see what's going to happen in this particular case. We don't get the fire. This is a minor limitation on the way the volumetric uh, uh, shader works. So let me pull this uh, on this side just to show you how you can go and fix that. So currently, for whatever reason, the density uh, requires always to have a channel, even if you're just doing uh, emission. And I think it, it needs some sort of thing to begin with. Anyhow, the easiest way to, to deal with that is you set the absorption to zero, and that will uh, eliminate, as far as I know, the, the, the density. So the density is calculated, but it's uh, pretty much invisible. So now we're looking only at the temperature. So let's close the scatter, close the absorption, and focus on the emission, which is the fire, uh, essentially. And you can sort of advance this and see what it looks like in the next frame. This will work with a cached VDB as well. Now, by definition, what happens is what we call black body is basically the amount of emission that something that's very hot creates. Uh, imagine an incandescent lamp or a fire uh, emits um, uh, something. So it, it, they, they're trying to do it in, in a more physical way, how uh, temperature becomes uh, light, photons and stuff. Uh, but we don't want that. We want to use this ramp here. Uh, to define our own uh, color. So number one, you replace it with ramp and you instead of black body, you say color ramp. So now we see that temperature uh, expressed as a black and white um, grid. This is what we are seeing in that particular case, but it uses these very high numbers. Now we have the highest temperatures indicated by the right side of the gradient and the lower temperatures up here, which are close to zero uh, here. So number one, we can clamp this, we can bring it in. And we can add any kind of um, uh, gradient. So I can take the rainbow gradient and set this to black just to have the lower values. And what you need to do is either you compress your gradient to get a bit more color uh, because the temperatures are uh, rather high. Then you can change the scaling of it to bring in all the temperatures. And usually I think uh, if you divide it by 100, you get things and there you go. So now you have a... A really interesting looking uh, fire. You can play with it. You can do all sorts of interesting things. I think if we add a black one over here, we're going to sort of reduce the amount of temperature internally. I don't even know what's going to happen here. But nonetheless, you can see how you can uh, uh, create a very interesting fires. This alone is worth at least, uh, I would say, three Ethereum. Just a, a screen grab it, and the first person that sells it uh, has... Um, uh, is allowed to use the copyright. There you go. Go get rich and just say that uh, it's thanks to me. When you, If anyone becomes famous and any of the stuff we do at the training team helped you become rich, famous, uh, healthy or good looking, uh, don't forget to tell everyone when they ask you uh, when you take your uh, Emmy Award or your Oscar or something like that, right? Please, and also, please don't forget. But, but one thing uh, you have to do um, is uh, credit Hannah because it was her question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. First, so you're going to walk up and you're going to say, uh, I want to thank uh, Hannah, uh, the Maxon training team. And then the music is going to play and you're going to say, I can't thank my parents because I have to go now. Right. Th those are your priorities. We Priorities are very important in life. <laughs> I figured out how to how to um, what to set up.
to make this work here. So I'm going to grab the screen back. Please, please. Back to you, Jonas. Let's use TV stuff. Now. Back to you, Jonas. Oh, well, here we go. You should see my screen now. There we go. All right. So I had the fluid fa uh, force factor at one and this made this whole thing explode. Um, and you have to go really, really low with the value here. That's that's the only thing that I didn't do. So I go down here and suddenly you can see that the interaction um, is there and it's reacting to the to the velocities from the pyro. Now, the question I add a collider was, to the text, add a collider to the text, add a collider to the text. I can do that. Totally. Here we go. And collider. Here we go. And now the thing is, how can we cache them separately? So with VDBs, that's absolutely no problem because you just um, you just cache it. It's going to be a VDB sequence anyway. But in the cloth uh, tag, um, usually when you want to cache the whole scene, you would press cache scene. And that's also what I usually do. But there's a difference between cache scene and calculate cache. Calculate cache will calculate the cache only for this object that the tag is on. So if I calculate cache here and just let it calculate, by the way, that force, <laughs> that uh, fuel force factor is basically how much the um, uh, fluid simulation, the pyro simulation, uh, affects the movement of simulations it's you can imagine it as the equivalent of the mass it works against the mass if yeah. your if your cloth object has a higher mass you need a higher uh, fuel factor to to uh, affect it so you balance those things out and you get your yeah. effect yeah cool so now you see that i i deactivated the pyro object here but the cloth is now um, cached and now i can scrub through the timeline here and it's first reacting to the velocity coming from the pyro and then it's falling onto the a and colliding that's it are there more questions i want to show one more thing i'm not going to show the setup i'm going to show you a little uh, interesting preview so was it, uh, one second oh, we can Just add a new attribute to you thanasis you're now not mm. only good looking and uh, have a sexy voice you also have a fantastic humor. Yeah, but we, we already know that, don't we? So let me take the screen from you. I'm going to take the screen from you, Jonas. Do it. You're repeating yeah. obvious things. So we should be seeing uh, in a couple of seconds a very beautiful. So this is an abstract house. And uh, actually, Did you say house? It was, uh, yeah, it's part of a house. So you would imagine this is part of a wall, part of a ceiling, part of the other wall. Um, okay. and you, just, you can make a whole house. Um, my very good, uh, friend Basti yesterday, he talked about this because someone else did it. Now, what I have here, these are rigid body dynamics and I have connectors, a connector that connects these two and a connector that connects these two. And, uh, I've got a uh, fuel on each and every one of these pieces of wood. And at the same time, I have my floor and I have a sphere that's going to light up fire. So I'm lacing fuel here. I'm going to start fire. But I also have these mini little espresso thingy bedoodles. And what this, what this is going to do, it's going to use a fall off node in espresso, which is basically a field list. And uh, I feel it. Uh, I feed it a position, which is a null. I have uh, the connectors, basically. I'm feeding this position here and this position here uh, in each and every one of my uh, Expresso tags. And what this is doing, it's reading the value of the temperature at that particular connector, either here or here. And with a range mapper, as uh, that temperature is going up, uh, the holding power of the connector is going down. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to just light a fire as the fire, and you will see this value is going to start going down as the temperature goes up. And it's going to reach a point where the forces are big enough to snap the connector. And if they don't, because this is touching it, it's going to happen in the next one. So let's select this and you'll see. And now this is going to snap and the house is going to crumble. So you can set this up for more complex 
objects, dynamic objects, and drive parameters uh, that allow you to demolish a house uh, in a procedural way. And you can control uh, how much of the temperature you want it to reach. You can create uh, accumulation of temperature. You can change various things based on those uh, parameters. But it's amazing how, again, just by using a handful of objects, eight objects, we're creating a procedural demolition by fire. And uh, this is going to become uh, one of the tutorials we, we, we're going to do um, in a couple of weeks. They're going to be uh, released. So I just wanted to show you another. Oh, here's a good question. Here's a good question. Can the cloth put out the fire? That's a good one. Um, I would say yes, if you make the cloth itself also a pyro um, object and just set the, um, the add values to, to negative. negative then it should work, yeah. Yep. Very good question. Well, there you go. Homework. Who asked that question? Who asked that question? Quickly. How can I open a banana? Uh, we won't... Uh, no, no bananas. See. Wait, wait, wait. Who asked that question? Uh, whoever where asked that question, question... Where was that question? Who where asked that question? question? I don't know. Well, whoever asked that question... Uh, use the information provided by Jonas and uh, show us what you managed to do on Twitter and tag the amazing training team. Or and, us. And, and the CEO. Yeah. So, the tags would then be Max on VFX. It would be Noseman Gur. Yeah, GR. It would be Jonas Pils 3D. And it would be Ellie Wade. Indeed. Well, I think I'm done for the day. I've got about another million things I can show, but we have to shut it down at some point. Right? Fifty-three people need... asked the question, by the way. Yeah. So let me <laughs> let me just grab the screen here. I'm gonna. Great. I'm gonna uh, take care of the housekeeping. That was an intense uh, session, and I just wanna, again, if you if you uh, tuned in late, I wanna make you aware of the events page on the Maxon website maxon.net slash events or when you're on the Maxon website you just go to news and then events and then you get to this beautiful site with all the shows listed that we are doing um, webinars live shows and so on and on Monday we have another MoGraph Monday another MoGraph webinar we have Maxon Color next Thursday we also have VFX and Chill next Friday so this Friday there won't be a VFX and Chill also uh, one thing that is going to be very interesting is the 3D Motion Show on December the 7th and so on and so forth. And if you, yeah, tuned in late or want to rewatch one of our, um, um, one of our beautiful webinars, then you can just go to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel and yeah, just explore it. There are hundreds of hours of training on there already and um, it's all very cool content and then the last thing I want to show is again the Maxon Ask the Trainer exclusive wear store and I hope that Ellie still has the links so she can uh, share a the link for um, the shop or to the shop and also the coupon code that you have to um, use while um, logging in so to speak and then you can choose a t-shirt you will get one for free and you only have to pay for the shipping. That's it. So I'm gonna jump back to to us. No screen share anymore. Well, thanks uh, a lot. Well, a quick uh, reply, quick reply. How yes, can, okay. uh, Mike Anderson, how can you make smoke go through a glass transparent object and you just don't make it a, a collider? <laughs> if that's what you mean, uh, it it will go through anything if that object is not a collider. So that's uh, not a problem. And you can control which side it's going to stop by backwards and sideways and uh, backwards and fronts. Anyway, uh, Twitter, follow us, ask questions because um, your questions drive uh, the content of our shows and our tutorials. When we see people asking about things, we cannot help it. We are like Roger Rabbit when he, he hears the tune. We have to respond. We have to offer a solution. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. So ask your questions on Twitter, make them public. Uh, so the information uh, is uh, there for everyone. And I personally want to thank everyone for being here 
at this uh, special day. Uh, eat as much as you can and deal with it over the next six months. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Also, thank you Noseman, thank you Ellie oh, for being here and showing stuff. And also, like you don't see that, but if you ever wondered who is creating all of the timestamps in the background for all of our webinars, that's Dr. Sassy. So again, a huge shout out to Dr. Sassy. Um, because he's doing an amazing job creating all of these timestamps so you can you can directly jump to the sections of our webinars um, that you are interested in. Super cool. All right. Again, thank you, everyone, and see, see you. you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.